Hi, this is Filiberta Mati, and uh, I'm here today with Marco Pevolo for another session uh, on the future of design. We have an esteemed guest, and Marco is going to introduce him. Uh, thank you, uh, Filiberto. Uh, our uh, series uh, is now uh, already seeing some protagonists of uh, contemporary design from uh, uh, industrial design, from uh, design thinking, from intellectual leadership, thought leadership, <clears throat> and uh, in a way uh, today uh, we have as a guest uh, uh, a, a designer uh, uh, all around uh, and all uh, uh, engaged in the discourse of uh, design thinking and design practicing, Satyendra Pakale. Satyendra, welcome uh, on uh, board with our uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, interview together with Filiberto and me. Uh, Satyendra and I uh, know each other uh, uh, for uh, having been both uh, through um, uh, Philips uh, design and the design team uh, led by uh, Stefano Marzano in, since uh, 1991 and until 2011. We actually never uh, work together, but we do know uh, our work through mutual interest and uh, a great mutual respect. Uh, Satyendra has uh, recently uh, printed uh, uh, his book, Culture of Creation, uh, with uh, uh, 9010 publishers in the Netherlands, one of the finest uh, design publishers uh, in the world. And uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, dialogue, we are going to touch upon uh, various aspects of uh, culture of creation from uh, social cohesion as an aspiration and as an objective of design to technology and the role of technology in implementing uh, design uh, uh, solutions and in inspiring design ideas and through the practice uh, uh, of uh, uh, Satyendra's uh, studio. But uh, would you like, uh, please, uh, to introduce yourself briefly, also in terms of your biography, your roots, uh, and your uh, foundation uh, that uh, brought you to design thinking and to the practice of design in your professional uh, experience? Yeah, thank you, Marco. Thank you, Filiberto, uh, for inviting. Uh, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to to speak with you after a long time. We go long back, but it's a, it's a it's an interesting uh, possibility to 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 engage, and especially on the occasion of the recently published book on our body of works. You know, uh, so that it just happened in the in the just the beginning of pandemic, and the book. Uh, has not uh, properly launched internationally as yet. I mean, it's been distributed, but it's not launched in a sense of uh, book uh, presentation and reviews. Uh, there has been one small event here in Amsterdam at the Cultural Center, Pakas uh, Desweige, uh, last year. And we look forward to how many more. Uh, the reason I start with the book is because the book is a result of uh, uh, last almost a quarter century uh, of engagement and work and the practice of last 23 years uh, uh, based here in Amsterdam. So it's, a, it's really a result of uh, a many, uh, let's say, points, many engagements, many intellectual curiosities, and, uh, and with that, the ideas which are very critical and important, we always felt in, the, in a practice to, to apply those ideas, you know, and we will uh, speak about those a uh, little further. Um, and eventually, um, uh, I hope that these points, which we try to bring across in a, in a monograph, uh, becomes a kind of a, a point of conversation, even a point of debate discussion uh, that goes further. Uh, well, we have been here actually in Amsterdam. I'm, uh, I set up a practice just after Philips, more or less, uh, in 98. Uh, that is uh, September 98 and uh, before that uh, been engaged with uh, Philips Design with these are the really the amazing days of Philips Design as we know we, when uh, Stefano Marzano was leading and uh, there were great projects were carried out and I've been part of that you've been part of that you know and uh, and and that actually that uh, really 
a, a kind of engagement, which uh, Stefano brought into conversation actually there and applied to technology in a very tangible manner. Those were not just theoretical ideas, but they became a tangible reality. And uh, that tangible reality, you still see in a product lines, uh, obviously things have changed for obvious reasons of technology and so forth. But you see the impact actually, uh, even now. And what I really appreciated that time and I still do is the, it was not just abstract thoughts and thinking and a direction, a theoretical thought, but that was always implemented in a practice. And you see that in end result as well, you know? So that has always been also my curiosity all, the, all along. And uh, before joining Philips, I, did a advanced studies at the at the Art Center College of Design in uh, Switzerland, uh, the American School. We've, I had uh, my amazing work experience uh, with another legendary office uh, frog design with uh, Hartmut Esslinger. That was another really important uh, uh, experience early on for me because understanding all the work they have done before, obviously the legendary work for Apple, but also for the next computer and many other. Uh, and that was really very, very crucial in my growing up as a designer, I would say, rather than practice. You know, <laughs> That was really the growing up as a designer. And, and before that, I studied design in India at the, at the very well-known school of uh, uh, industrial design called Industrial Design Center. Uh, it's in. It's a part of Indian Institute of Technology, and which was founded by a professor who studied at the Ulm School, the historic Ulm School. So there is a very strong link with the international design community. It has been, and especially when I went to school then, there that time there was a uh, twenty years of. Um, uh, uh, after the, let's say, Woolman after was a big conference that was 20 years of existence of a school when I was going to school there. And I met many of this design fraternity from all around the world, especially Europe and the rest of the world, Japan included to all the way to South and North America, you know. So that has been amazing, uh, let's say, time at the design school there. So, so that has been my journey. I grew up in a, in a, right in a geographical center of India, which is right in the middle. And uh, this is a different time, of course, no internet, no access to information like we take it for granted now. So of course, uh, it's been a longer journey and uh, here we are to talk about and, uh, and to talk in, the, in a form of monograph. And I must say, we were very, very cautious not to make a obvious monograph. So it is by any definition, not the obvious monograph. Yeah. That just some projects and that's it. No, it's really a book which engages thoroughly with the topic. And I'm very humble and honored to have amazing amount of thinkers, practitioners who have contributed to the book, um, such as Paolo Antonelli, okay. and obviously Stefano Mazzano, Johanny Palasma, the great architect from Finland, uh, Eric Chan, who is currently now the director of the Steam Leadings Fund here in, uh, in uh, Rotterdam, but he used to be the uh, the curator in chief of M plus before actually in Hong Kong and many other things he did. And there are so many number of people among them also my close associates and teammates, uh, uh, Professor Tiziana Proetti, she's now teaching at uh, Oklahoma. She's been part of her team for a very long time and, and so forth. So there's been a really thorough engagement and, uh, and also on a curatorial side, uh, Ingeborg the Roda, one who did my first design exhibition at the State League Museum. She also did a critical review of the work and so forth. So there's a very thorough, uh, let's say, analysis engagement on several topics, including the body of work, yeah. Before we delve uh, into culture of creation uh, uh, more and into your uh, uh, history and vision of the what the strategic impact of design is and what the future of design is, uh, I would like uh, uh, to ask Filiberto to reflect with me and to address you with a question about the impact of digitalization. You mentioned Armut Esslinger of uh, Frog Design, uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, product design firms uh, of the 1970s, 80s and 90s, and currently very much a digital agency working on uh, digital solutions. Uh, Filiberto, would you like... Uh, also from your experience in uh, uh, the design of brands uh, and in the marketing uh, of consumer electronics uh, 
products uh, with uh, with Philips itself and uh, as consultant. Would you like to uh, reflect and to uh, inspire Satyendra on the impact of digitalization on the future of design? Actually, uh, I have a very specific question because Satyendra, uh, and through his uh, work, has always been, uh, you know, and what you just said, linking uh, uh, the theoretical model and framework with the practical work of building, of creation. So how do you get ready for creating new products when uh, with the current development of the metaverse and digital technologies, products will have a non-physical dimension, which uh, will have to go you know, beyond the replica of, uh, okay, let's do a 3D model of, <laughs> you know, yeah. there will be different type of interaction. We, we saw recent examples of Heineken launching uh, a brew for uh, uh, the metaverse, but there are other examples of, uh, you know, luxury stores, uh, luxury brands launching uh, platforms, which of course are not just stores, but they're also uh, engagement platforms for the metaverse. So how do you get ready and what is your vision in that perspective? Yeah, uh, uh, Filberto, this is a very good and appropriate uh, engagement and discussion we need to have, and I'm glad you asked that as a first question. I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to really see how these things are developing in a way. Uh, let me say something obvious thing, which we've seen happening, you know, as, uh, you know, the evolution of technology uh, as, as we've seen it. The first time uh, we all know that we experience and we're old enough to know or remember this. First time the Apple came with the, with the, the computer that the graphic designer could manipulate the, the let's say the graphical image. Uh, it was like an explosion. Everybody could try whatever. It took time till it settled down the dust and, and the refined work came out of it. Same thing happened later with product design. You know, like the moment we got the 3D softwares, some of those we don't even use anymore, like CDRS and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now um, it, it, people started doing whatever the wacky shapes, you know, I'm thinking it's cool. And even the image moves on the screen. I remember those days. Uh, I have been the part of that journey that where people were so excited just because something moved on the screen, yeah? We gone from there, the product design world has evolved, matured and created something. Then architecture got the 3D software. And then again, you got all kinds of crazy things, uh, shapes, forms, whatever, till the meaning is made actually. And now you see refined practices trying to create meaning, which is, which hopefully these new, let's say expressions will last as long as what we have, some of the past ex expressions in architecture, we have it with us since centuries, you know? Uh, so now coming to the metaverse world, I think right now what is happening is our so early steps actually, it is like the reason I'm bringing the graphic design, product design and architecture example of using a 3D software is exactly what's happening now with everybody using the metaverse, you know? Now, the question is, you know, we absolutely need to think and engage in a mature way what should be and what could be the built environment. I call it built again, yeah? I don't want to say virtual world, yeah? There's a reason for that as well, yeah? The reason is the, the built world, what we have, the physical world, and the virtual world, it cannot be just the copy of it, first of all, yeah? That is often done and that happens. That's, a, that's almost like a childlike uh, learning curve where you imitate and you learn. But on the other hand, it's also not something completely like, uh, which has no, uh, any kind of a, a sense with our perception and the way we, uh, uh, let's say, sense the world, perceive the world. Uh, this topic of perception, sensoriality is very dear to my heart because that's how we as a human being uh, function. And that is a big part of conversation in the book as well. And thanks to Johanny Palasma, who has done a great deal of work on sensorial design, uh, he engages on a topic like that, about especially about creating atmosphere of object, creating atmosphere within the context of built architecture environment. Now, the early examples, what we see with the metaverse are really incredibly silly, some of them, you know, I'm sorry to say that. Almost silly that maybe some freaks are interested, they, okay, it's something cool, whatever, but 
that's not the reality. It cannot be the reality. Uh, with due respect to all the corporations who are going on the first bandwagon of a metaverse and release either footwear or some other products, they also don't have that gravity actually as yet, you know, in terms of the kind of articulateness one could have. And this is very much an engagement and conversation we're having internally within our team as well, is that what kind of a language, what kind of a shape, even if I'm building my virtual place and I want to have a nice dinner party with you, a couple of other friends. So I would like to have something that represent and projects my personality or my way of thinking or my way I would like to see the world, even the idealized world, if I could say. But it cannot be just some whatever, you know. It cannot be something which doesn't have a gravity. You float here and there and there, you know. That is just the one very obvious interpretation. Now, uh, are we there yet? No, we are not there yet. Just like when the graphic design came, it took certain time to settle down the dust and then refined work is come, has, has evolved from that. Same with architecture and product design. Same thing will happen with this as well. But unfortunately, as we speak now, a lot of people like us, which are critical, regular, rigorous creators and thinkers and engage with the practice, we ought to come and engage also with the metaverse as well, in a, in a very objective and a real way, you know? And what will be that expression, whether it, it, it I am obviously saying that it cannot be just the, obviously the, the exact built environment, what we have, the physical reality, but it cannot be also some wacky, whatever things you see right now, which also is not the, not the possibility. What I really wish personally, if I could add at the last point, is that the point where can we create a projection and the kind of possibility in a metaverse that will help us perfect our lived environment, built env uh, environment, make it better, you know, and even make it provocatively better, actually. That would be the reverse effect I would like to see from the metaverse. I, I have a follow-up yeah. uh, because as a non-designer, uh, my understanding of design has always been on two levels. There is a functional and an emotional part. And uh, design makes the functional part better, but it brings a world of emotion which connect uh, uh, with the physical and um, tactile and the functional as well characteristics you know you mentioned the first mac it was like wow you know who doesn't want to work with it uh, or who doesn't want to the first imac when when they moved beyond the idea that computers need to be square boxes uh, you know in either one of two colors which were by the way grading of the same color so that's my impression of what the design is on this side of reality. And when I look at the metaverse, it seems to me that there is an emotional part. But what I like very often is actually the physical component. I mean, the functional component, not the physical component. The what is this useful for? What does it help doing beyond transposing what we have uh, today into a digital reality. You know, is that the issue with the metaverse at this stage or uh, goes well beyond that? Uh, I, think, I, I think, first of all, let me say, if I could say, <laughs> allow me to say that I would not divide design to be functional and emotional. I think design is everything. Design is, is really cultivates and shapes your perception in a true, true positive sense. In a, it can bring a social positive change. That is my aspiration as a design, actually, where it just works. But working and singing, I don't think, I mean, these things I don't want to divide or see it in a separate way that something is functional and something is emotional, you know? So if we as a human being, you know, if we would not be, let's say, utilitarian, we will never do this or we never clap because then you say, why? What is the function of this? You see, we'll use hands only to climb, hold, or to do something. That's very functional, right? So that is the reality of a human being. Human being is beyond that, you know. The human being is always about sensoriality that has a lot more senses. 
emotion being one of that, our, all the hum, human sensorial reality together with our perception, together with the utility and beyond is, is a true sense of design. That is very hard to achieve in every project actually, you know? And, and within that actually, uh, whether this is opening up our fantasy or dream world, you know, or if it is creating a, rea a connection with back to a reality or how it should be, I think all these questions are up for the graph. I think another thing is what will be its effect on our psychology? That is, again, is not understood completely. And, and, and I think unless those early mistakes are made and understood and things are taken into some direction, I want to bring one example here though, that if you look at the same thing happened with the music videos, you know, if you look at the early nineties music videos, you know, there are some, um, so many effects all crashed into one. If you look from that time period, there could be one or two videos you can take where people have understood the medium and try to use it in a meaningful manner. You know, so this has always happened with technology that people get excited and then they want to do, and that's what happening with the metaverse because everything is possible compared to graphic design only, there was just the graphic 2D work, you know, now uh, product design, there was just object, architecture, there was just one building. Now here is everything. It's like a complete environment you can build, you know. So, so here we need to go through those, those uh, let's say early excitement, try out, experiment, but we need to settle down the dust and try to navigate ourselves to see really what we need to and where we can engage and go from there and open really for those discoveries, not to have preconceived ideas, yeah. Thank you. Marco? Yes, uh, from the metaverse uh, to our uh, global uh, uh, reality uh, at the moment, which well, there are several challenges. Uh, chapter four of your, uh, <clears throat> of your book, uh, Cultural creation uh, has been contributed by Arik uh, Cheng and uh, bears, the, bears the title Design and Pluralism. Um, we discussed before, uh, Satyendra, you and I, in one of our encounters, uh, the challenges of social cohesion. Uh, do you see uh, in the future uh, uh, for design a political role uh, in achieving cohesion uh, through societies? Do you see a role that might go back to the modernist ideas of Bauhaus, uh, of um, uh, the schools of design that had uh, a social mission, or do you see this happening uh, implicitly? Uh, how do you see the future of design uh, with respect to uh, its mission in society? for in general and for you? Yeah, of uh, I think, uh, in a, uh, I, I always think every act, you know, and a creative act for definitely is a political act, you know? Uh, so political, not in electoral politics, what we know with the politician, but the moment anybody creates whatever you create, if you are aware or not, it's a political act, you know? So deeply designed at its foundation is a political act, you know? One cannot deny that. You may not understand it or you may not be serious about it, but it's just a fact, you know? So, so in a true sense of politics, you know, to understand, to manifest, I think, and that's very much, um, uh, let's say, uh, a powerful tool in, in that sense of, uh, of engaging with the society and try to create whatever, uh, whatever you want to manifest within that context of a project, you know? So design has always been a political act. Now, if you take the consumerism that we developed and practice and put it so much high that we almost, uh, almost every industry worship as a, as a better than a God, not that I believe in a God, but just to say that, yeah, uh, as a metaphor, uh, that, uh, that, that became the only possibility and people became kind of blinded for the other possibilities what design could be. Uh, I think in a true sense, I would say design, uh, the evolution of design, because design as a term and as a practice and as a profession, compared to, let's say, other creative professions is a relatively, has a relatively shorter history, you know. So from that perspective, I do see design 
could even go in the arena of a politics where it is already there, in fact, actually, not could go. I have to correct myself. If you look at the campaign of all the presidential campaigns, all the prime minister campaigns, if you look at the understanding of perception and how they, at the graphical level, it is already there. You go to the election, any, any, any common municipal election here in the city, you see the posters and all that is already used, you know? So it's not something new. In terms of shaping a society, that is already used on a visual level, let's say, yeah? On a presentation level, on a, on a, on a let's say, uh, somehow controlling the perception level, you know? Like the perception of, perception of a candidate and so on and so forth. But really at the level of policy, therefore shaping the society, therefore restructuring the society, I think at that level, we have the things are there, but they are not manifested to the level how design could positively impact and create positive change for a wider masses, actually. And I think that is, in my understanding, if the world goes in a, in a normal succession, hopefully that will happen. And that is my optimism, that design will go in that direction that it will help shape the society in a positive way, you know? So that would be the, the right thing I would say to, to, to happen, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, in one of my uh, uh, lectures, I show students uh, a big uh, pen and I explain to them that this is a revolutionary tool because it opened up the possibility to write uh, and to have a writing tool uh, to basically anyone in, in the world by bringing yeah. the product. Then, of course, there is the uh, challenge of uh, environmental uh, sustainability because the big bang right. is plastic, but uh, uh, in origin, it was a tool of democratization. We exactly. normally, with Filiberto, we try to probe wild cards or try to understand uh, if you want to see the future of design, where you should uh, look into uh, fine arts or um, or other uh, domains. But in, uh, in in the case of this uh, of this dialogue, uh, if Filiberto uh, agrees and, and bears with me, I would like to invite you to select a couple of examples from your practice uh, that you consider. Uh, particularly uh, representative of uh, possible evolution of design in the future. It doesn't matter if it's a project of uh, 20 years ago, uh, but from your perspective, uh, if I ask you, where do I see the future of design in this case, in your practice, where uh, would you point out what would be two, three, outstanding examples that have been uh, published uh, and printed in uh, the culture uh, of creation in your book? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Marco, one, one thing comes to my mind, it's too much of saying this is it and this is going to be it. Nobody can say that. Actually. Of course, be, of course. That will be too difficult. People, they, I always say, uh, whenever uh, everybody who speaks about future, we always speak future in a retrospect. I mean, everybody talks about the future looking in the rear view mirror. So people, when the first time iPhone came, or iPod came, people started when it already happened, right? They're talking and they're singing about the songs of the innovation when it already happened, actually, you know? Exactly. When, and when we were in mid-90s, 95, 96, 97, cultivating the handheld objects in a, in a vision, um, you know, the Covadis, you know, the project, uh, vision on move, we were considering all these handheld devices and objects and there are already folding screens and all those ideas are there. Navigation for children, to parents, to elderly people, to, to read letters when you can't read because of your eyesight is not there or you can't hear, all those things are there. You know, none of those, I, I mean, many of those ideas can become real, which we're practicing in that kind of sense. So it's, it's always, I must say that with the it's very hard to say this is it and this is going to be the future. And nobody knows that, you know, and if somebody's saying that, that person is probably not saying the correct thing because, no. because it, in historically, if you look at all the examples, whoever tried to predict future, they were terribly wrong, you know? So it's very difficult to say. I can say, I wish this could go and develop further, but I cannot say this is it. And this no, no, no. The but that's, that's your vision that yes. uh, Filiberto and I would really like you to share your vision yeah. 
from a methodological point exactly. of view, the yeah. future uh, cannot be uh, studied as history yeah. because it didn't happen yet. However, from history, we can... Uh, Project, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In all fairness, when Marco and I speak about future, since he's a forest and expert, we, we speak about possible, probable futures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's terrible we never focus on one yeah. because we know that would be foolish. Yeah. No, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the question of, uh, because, you know, of course, the uh, I'm keen and curious about the built environment in a very broad way in every sense, actually, from an object level to architecture level and what comes in between, such as mobility of systems and so forth, you know. So the book does publish all those kind of books in terms of projects related to mobility, as well as projects related to object, to projects related to something, what could become a new possible possibility of manufacturing and possibilities, you know. Uh, I. I'm always very curious that the built environment, because it shapes our reality, therefore says shapes our well-being, in fact, in a, in, a, in a true positive way. So the design can have that impact on us, actually, you know, on an on object level to, to built environment, architecture, or a city level, you know. And, and what is very interesting thing is actually those thoughts and ideas are manifested in a book in a very precise manner, in a sense that the object itself has that sensorial quality and that has its own impact on our lives, actually, you know. And there are many objects which, uh, which we have engaged in, are, they are in the book, actually, from very different types of material, from ceramic to bronze to aluminium to stainless steel and so on and so forth. And, and, and that is the expression that has been used. But, and there's a lot of exercise gone into making in terms of materiality. So as much as I can say, I'm a designer who, who grew up together with this, all the 3D softwares as they were going, but I also was very critical about the 3D softwares and wanted to engage with the physical reality and also try to understand what is gone behind us and be, before us and learn those, those uh, materials by really engaging with it, you know? So the result of that practice really, I would say, tangibly manifest into one important project that is the radiator, the add-on radiator, you know, which is not just a pretty object to look at, but it's a very technological product, but it doesn't manifest any technology at all. And then it's just a screen where air passes through, actually, you know. And the idea there is really after it's, it's been a long journey. It's, it's a, it was a four years of product development. And eventually, it really saves up to 40% of the, the, the energy because, you know, traditionally all the radiators, uh, since the last pandemic, actually, I learned even more now during this pandemic, that the radiators were designed to, to install just next to the, to the window. So the air comes and the warm air comes inside. So we probably, you saw that in Manhattan, they still have a problem that the buildings are heated too much, but that was the need of the pandemic that time, you know? Now, the idea of this radiator is that it is really a radiator that can be seamlessly integrated in architecture. Now, that exercise to, to create a kind of a fixture that can go from Canada to Australia, from Japan to South America and any country in between, you know, to uh, where it can just fit. That was a huge work, actually, design and engineering work. But at the end, it, it successfully works. So where I'm coming to that, all the exercises practice of working on ceramic, metal, manufacturing, all of that, manifest into that project eventually becomes uh, a, a, a product which becomes icon eventually now, after all these years, if I could say, it's still considered one of the innovative product in that industry, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, so, so it, it not only does it create the, the, the let's say, aesthetically pleasing object, but it is also energy saving object. It is also, it defines the architecture space. It creates certain ambience and so forth, you know? So, so I hope, you know, it's, it's, and again, it's not a product in, a, in itself, it's a system product because it goes in a part of the architecture. Heating is a big, big uh, uh, cost as well in terms of energy we, we, we consume and use, you know? So all of those issues are, back of the, uh, uh, are, are behind that uh, design solution finally that became real and industrial and manufactured 
since last 15 years since in the market. So, so I really hope and wish that we could create more products which are, which are that long lasting. They are not about fashion at all. They are not like one season because when you put a radiator in a house, you don't say I change in six months. You know, it's there as long as the house is there, you know, or longer even, you know. And that has been the thinking around about uh, almost all kind of products. So for me, this idea of so-called sustainability, long lasting, these are not new ideas. Mm -hmm. I said this a long, long time ago. Almost any culture you go on the planet, these ideas were there. We trashed those ideas in the last 60, 70 years since the industry and consumerism came into picture, actually. But these practices were in the practice of living, how people cook their food, how they ate, how they consume, how they made their stuff. It was, it has been in every culture you can go around, actually, around the planet, you know. Well, so to bring back that thinking, but in an innovative way. Yeah. Actually, Robert Gruding in his book on designing, Robert uh, Gruding is a uh, is actually coming from humanities. He defines design as uh, the principle, the way to organize energy, to organize light, uh, and to organize uh, the systems that support life. So it's quite interesting that you chose, uh, uh, that, that you picked uh, a, a project, a signature project of your portfolio, which has to do with heat, uh, which of course is a very contemporary topic at the moment uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it uh, brings uh, design into an apparently anonymous uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, one of those uh, objects that we do not see during the day, but are fundamental to our quality of life and our uh, uh, well-being. Uh, Filiberto, do you have any comment or any? No, I have a follow-up question based on what you just said. And I like, you know, uh, let's look at uh, what's next uh, for Satyan in terms of uh, not future from the rear view, but uh, uh, based on, you know, present looking forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, part of the research I've done with Marco in the past, we, uh, uh, we talked about the blurification of categories and you know, boundaries because, uh, you know, from an industrial point of view, technological development, it's really making sure that industry we were traditionally known adjacent are converging okay so now you mentioned mobility mobility it's an important platform for restaurateurs for hoteliers for healthcare and of course for for cities who need to be more sustainable so uh, we see that in many industries the traditional categories definition are completely blurred. If you think that now you have uh, spirits company launching non-distilled beverages and uh, beverage soft drink manufacturers who are launching hard seltzers, which are basically soft drinks with alcohol. <laughs> so you see that there is a lot of, uh, uh, of this convergence in that sense. And yeah, a bit of a mess. So if there were, uh, a project, an industry, a sector, a product, where you say, look, I would really want to fix that. I would really want to focus my time, my two years, three years, in solving that problem or in redesigning the way we do uh, mobility, the way we do buildings, the way we do uh, air conditioning, the way we do, I don't know. What would that be and why? And I have to talk to you about my current projects. So it's going to be difficult. <laughs> but anyway, I will try. So nothing, nothing confidential, but <laughs> okay. you know, a, no, wish, but... a wish for the future, of course. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, the, the point you mentioned is very much so, uh, that, that many, there are many challenges which need to be solved. And uh, one of those is, obviously, there's a lot of talk, and we are engaged with that as well. And, and, and let's see where it goes, because these are all unknowns, you know. Uh, two areas I want to mention, uh, and then another area I want to mention as well. But first two areas which are, uh, let's say, could be converging and could be next to each other as well is healthcare and, and robotics, you know, and uh, robotics in a social robotics. I mean, talking about the robotics which engages with the people, you know, so healthcare and this, you know, the both these areas very much, these are the new engagements we have we've been 
involved with you know but but the 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 both these contexts you know there is a lot of talk about ai on one side there's a lot of talk about robotics but there's really still it is stuck in that fantasy world of 50s what a robotic should be it's not evolved from that and it's very hard to find any significant example where it's not just the humanoid puppet a robot which is a social robot or the other extreme is just a box you know there's nothing you can find in between these two extremes actually you know that is that is another problematic which is which is which has to be engaged and we are dealing with uh, the healthcare directly relates with that because it has to do with a lot to do with the engagement with the individual you know on a different ways you know so and there are in healthcare sector actually there are many things which are outrightly extremely polluting and they have been accepted because because um, the big pharma companies are behind it under the name of so called taking uh, care of human life uh, they have just created so much throwaway products you know just single use just for the sake of saying hygiene or whatever they all need to be looked at i mean it creates a tremendous amount of of uh, amount of um, uh, let's say uh, trash which has not been thought through and it's a kind of a gray area nobody criticizes because it's supposed to be for the health you know and the the amount of money made by some companies on that it's just obscene actually because it it is for the health you know and it kind of get camouflage into public uh, health schemes and and uh, policies where the nobody really looks at the cost you know so these are the two areas the other area that requires a lot of work and 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 i hope we get possibilities to engage we have some early engagements and some early things are happening but that requires a lot more work actually to think critically and understand you know because they are just designed just to exploit you know to a, to a, to a level you can't imagine actually and when i've seen some of those things out of my own curiosity and some what goes in a hospital and especially during the pandemic time it is just shocking you know because it's never thought through at all actually you know so that is one the other area which is also very dear to me and 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 there's an engagement is the on a city level like you know urban level at the same time the the context of let's say shaping a physically the the the, the context of a city or a, or a, or, a, or a town or a city or a, or a, or a place and within that context the 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 let's say seamless integration of some way uh, one could say infrastructure and the main infrastructure being mobility because uh, i think in a, in that sense of public tra public transport i think it's very very important i'm not talking about mobility in a sense of just the everybody having little scooter and an electric battery and then uh, two or two years later those batteries will be trashed i don't know where you know that's uh, that's another i'm i'm talking about on a public scale I, i'm talking on the infrastructure scale and i think in that sense there is quite some work to be done as well you know and all the developments which are there right now in terms of technology and all the developments which are there what we got the benefit of let's say communication now are yet to be implemented actually you know in a public infrastructure so that is that's a new area that's open area a lot of work to need to be done on there and whoever does i don't mind i would be really happy to be engaged with that area as well we had some early conversations but that's a public policy thing you know that's a bigger thing but i think within the schemes and the developments you see within european community i i hope and at least i see at least at the level of conceptual study work and if they see there is a hope they could, those ideas could become real actually yeah well thank you very much i would like to uh, ask you a last question uh, um considering uh, uh, the the richness and the depth of uh, of your book cultural creation uh, i assume it will be taken on board by students by academies by academics what would be your message uh, your core message uh, even a slogan if you like or what would be your intent uh, uh, towards uh, uh, students who will be designers of the future in particular students uh, who uh, who um, come from uh, from india from uh, from asia who engage in a dialogue 
uh, across uh, countries, across continents, as you did. What would be your uh, call based on uh, uh, the um, history, uh, the thinking, and uh, the reflections that you uh, shared in the book? Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, Marco. I mean, there are many issues in the book actually, and I would try to give a broad cross section, but eventually, hopefully, give a direction as well. But uh, uh, the book, when we created a book, the idea has always been uh, that there has always been intellectual curiosities, and how can we synthesize and and bring in all those uh, those um, uh, uh, topics. Uh, to conversation within a one book, actually, which was itself a challenge uh, uh, in, in a way because there are many issues, craftsmanship to technology to question related to industry, question related to, to social modernity, which is a very important issue. We all face on a planet, not at one place than the other. Uh, talking about societies, how the societies are, vertical societies are, how much more oppression and so forth, so forth. Uh, talking about the link of that at the artisanal world and the link of artisanal world with the industry, how industry depends on artisanal work as well, actually developments. And, and, and of course, there is, a, there is an engagement in terms of a practice and the whole engagement of what we, uh, let's say, um, create as a practice and how that practice manifests those ideas, you know, into a tangible reality. That is somehow uh, manifest even in a, in a project I want to bring is a non-electric kitchen appliances, you know, where the things are not backward looking, but a forward looking, understanding from the past actually, you know. So there are a lot of those ideas. Now these issues are quite interlinked, you know and quite uh, interconnected. They cannot be separated in my understanding. And, and that was the purpose. The, another intent we had while making a book is as well, is can we create a book which, which will trigger the imagination of anybody who is curious, then be it a filmmaker or writer or a designer or architect or a or, landscape. Or student, or student. Our student, of course, they all come into that actually, you know, and in, in that sense of student being anybody for that matter who is curious. So that has been our objective. So there are a lot of process photos. So there are really almost uh, three books in one book because there is a, the, the, the critical part, the, the, the writings, uh, that is one part, the whole process and the methods and the, the practice where all the meticulously photograph each uh, steps and and all the, the, the let's say, the, the vibrant practice, what brings a day to day, those photos are somehow try to bring that story to life, you know, not just by words, but through images as well. And also last, but the most important is the body of work, which, so these three facets are very strong, almost three books in one book. That's why it became such a big book. At the same time, there has always been a curiosity how one could connect those ideas. So the index is generally back of the book, which nobody really looks at. We have in the front of the book and it serves as the, uh, as the possibility, those who are curious to connect the dot from people to places, to organizations, to cultural context, even to the ideas of cultural connection. The reason why I'm mentioning all this broad idea is genuinely because I believe, and that is really the, the, the thing is that design is a cultural act. Design is a cultural act, though it has all the component of a society from technology to sociology, to psychology, to whatnot, to understanding perception. And, and at the same time, uh, eventually it is a cultural act. It is not a technical act actually, you know? And if one understands and gets that message through the book, I'll be happy. And I think anybody who's interested and engaged with that to understand, be it a policymaker or a student, uh, be it a politician or a, or a industrialist, uh, be it uh, a professor or a, a fellow designer or architect. I think what is really important is that to have that curiosity and to bring that plurality because there is no one discourse and the book also manifests that because the world is a fascinating place and often design is looked at in a very narrow perspective. Uh, every, the whole world is filled with creation and possibilities, you know, how one could create that from that knowledge and understanding a contemporary expression in your own manner itself is a challenge and an interesting, fascinating, uh, let's say, journey. And, and that is, I think, has to be understood in a plural way. 
So you bring in the point which Arik, uh, Arik Chan brings it to his, his essay. I think these are very, very crucial and important point. And the same point further, uh, Jack Bursak in his another axiom, uh, axiomatic design, one of, the, one of the essays in the book as well. He also bring that point in a different way, talking from a cultural plurality perspective, talking from the social modernity perspective and the ideas which we have cultivated over a period of time in terms of social modernity and how that manifests and has to be evolved in a direction of social cohesion. I think these are some of the core ideas of the book. Yeah. And I, I think somehow we need to engage more to talk about it, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Filiberto. Satyendra, thank you very much. It was really inspiring uh, uh, talking to you and thank you for answering our questions. Uh, and I, I really hope this is the beginning of a dialogue in the future as well. So to have you back uh, with us, uh, you know, maybe before the next book or, <laughs> or during the next book as well. Yeah, I would like uh, to show one last time Satyendra Pakale, Culture of Creation, nine, nine zero ten publishers uh, in the Netherlands. Thank you, Satyendra. We are looking forward to stay in touch indeed as we did in the past and as we will do in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Filberto. Thank you for inviting me and I look forward to continue our conversation. Thank Great. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.